Hi everyone, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 5th of November. Today, uh, Sebastian and I are grateful to all our uh, keynote speakers and to you all for uh, joining us and helping us combat work from home isolation. Please do subscribe to our channel and access the past talks in the case you have missed any of them. All of them are uh, quite uh, interesting and exciting for, for you. Um, and also there is a, another initiative uh, called Tea Time Talk Series uh, for uh, junior researchers and for everybody else, but uh, speakers are junior researchers. Please do uh, attend and uh, volunteer to share your research and try to build up your network uh, as well. Also, as we are getting close to the end of the year, we were just speaking with Sebastian that we are going to try to find a nice program for all of you to feature all of you. We have more than 1,400 subscribers, and we are trying to find a way to have you all be featured in our uh, channel as well. So stay tuned for more detailed information to come soon. Now to the lecture of uh, this uh, week. Uh, we are pleased and honored to announce that uh, Professor Hamdi Chalepi is our keynote speaker of today. Uh, Hamdi wouldn't really need uh, my introduction, still uh, out of respect, I would uh, read a few lines about him. Um, Hamdi is Professor of Energy Resource Engineering, Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford University, uh, which is a department uh, within the School of Earth. He is currently also chair of the department as well. Hamdi is distinguished member of SPE and uh, owner of the Robert Earl McConnell Award of SPE and AIME. This is a joint uh, medal that they both uh, offer. He also has received President's Individual Achievement Award of Chevron and Schlumberger Intersect Project. He's editor of SIAM, Multiscale Modeling and Simulation, and has been in number of committee boards uh, uh, that cannot be really listed or I cannot really mention here, all of them. He has also offered hundreds uh, uh, of keynote and invited uh, speeches in different scientific events across the globe. And uh, he has been also since 2006, been co-director of SUPRIB uh, program, uh, Stanford University Petroleum Research Institute for Reservoir Simulation. And he's a lead scientist in diverse fields of reservoir modeling and simulation and has made significant impact in the scientific community, not just for his excellent research leadership, papers, keynote speeches, but also for his superb teaching and mentorship. I am one of the many who owe him for all uh, we have achieved as well. Hamdi holds a BSc, MSc and PhD all in petroleum engineering respectively from University of Petroleum and Minerals, King Fahd University and Stanford University. After his PhD, he spent nearly for about, I guess, 10 years or so with Chevron uh, before he joined Stanford as a, as a faculty member. Please do visit his scholar page for most of his research outputs. Today he is with us to uh, give a lecture about the kind of perhaps booming topic of artificial intelligence and machine learning and many of you are quite interested in learning more about it. So we are extremely happy and pleased that he accepted to give this lecture today. Uh, so we all learn about this subject uh, more in detail. It's a pleasure and, uh, and honor to host you, Hamdi. Thank you very much for graciously accepting our talk, uh, our invitation to give a talk despite being so early now uh, up in California. To the audience, please note his lecture will last for about 30 minutes and then followed by questions like always, Please type your questions in the chat room. Sebastian will uh, chair the discussion session afterwards. Without any further ado, uh, Hamdi, the uh, screen bandwidth, this, the lecture is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hadi. Uh, and thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I am uh, delighted to uh, be part of this uh, geoscience and geoenergy webinar series. I think it's an excellent way to keep the community connected in these uh, difficult times. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are on uh, the planet. Uh, I will uh, today discuss 
a uh, topic that is receiving a great deal of attention. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about physics-informed machine learning for multi-phase transport in porous media. Uh, the material that I present here was part of a PhD dissertation that was actually defended and uh, accepted by Olga Fuchs. Uh, she completed her PhD and last Monday moved uh, to uh, work for Google here in uh, Silicon Valley. So before we get into the details of the specific problem that I'm going to talk about, I want to paint a slightly wider context related to subsurface multi-phase flow and transport. So when one is asked to model the dynamics of large scale subsurface systems, you have several challenges. So these are deeply buried subsurface formations. They have highly heterogeneous multi-scale properties and access to specific measurements for the particular location that you're interested in can be quite expensive. Think of drilling wells to retrieve core samples, for example, or to perform electronic log analysis. So these data that you get are both expensive and they tend to be a sparse sampling of the enormous volumes that are really of interest. So this combination of having a highly heterogeneous multi-scale distribution of properties combined with sparse information and measurements about the specific target you're interested in, that usually leads to making uncertainty in the predictions themselves. So we refer to this uh, uncertainty propagation as the process of taking your input, which is heterogeneous but not completely known, so there is uncertainty in the details of the reservoir properties. You take these realizations of the reservoir properties, subject them to a flow process, a reservoir simulator, to model the recovery or displacement process of interest, and you get a response. Uh, if you do that for many, many realizations, then you ultimately get a distribution of results that reflects the uncertainty in the predictions you make based on the limited information that you have in the input. And so in my group over the years, with the help of colleagues, but mainly students and postdocs, we have looked at this question of propagating the uncertainty from the input to the output using a variety of techniques beyond the standard Monte Carlo method of gener generating a large number of realizations and processing each to produce a simulation. So, I'm not gonna go through the details of all of these efforts on uncertainty propagation. Like I said, many of them have been in my group, in other groups in Stanford, and in many other academic institutions throughout the world. Many of the people involved in this uh, webinar have been working on these topics for uh, many, many years. So here, what I wanna focus on uh, is uh, this uh, resurgence of uh, machine learning methods. Uh, and we sit here in Silicon Valley and at Stanford, and this wave uh, is uh, a strong one and is a sweeping one. Uh, so within the machine learning methods uh, to model dynamics of complex flow processes, uh, there are data-driven approaches and uh, physics-informed machine learning approaches. So, so this is sort of a very high-level binning of the strategies, and I'm going to focus 
on the physics informed machine learning variant uh, that is uh, been led by Raisi et al and Joe et al from the uh, groups of professors Karnia Dakis and uh, Zabaras so Karnia Dakis and Zabaras have been leading the way on building up the framework the mathematical and computational framework for physics informed machine learning and we're going to be building on their works so let's get into the specific details of the problem we want to look at so the uh, machine learning frameworks have been already quite successful in a wide variety of fields including computer vision, speech recognition, image recognition, but uh, we here are interested in employing machine learning strategies to solve physics problems governed by uh, certain conservation laws and principles. And again, we are gonna follow on the works of Raisi and Zhu, and within that, uh, specifically look at this subset where we are interested in solving a nonlinear hyperbolic partial differential equation for transport of two-phase flow in porous media. This sounds like a lot of uh, uh, stuff. We're simply talking about the modeling of the flow of two immiscible fluids in one dimension and the governing equations that describe that is a nonlinear partial differential equation so with uh, the machine learning uh, frameworks that are available again we're doing here two big bins on the left is the uh, supervised learning which requires uh, streams of labeled data. This is not our focus today. Our focus today will be on leveraging domain knowledge, that is, injecting knowledge about the laws of the physics of the problem that you're interested in, hopefully with the potential of being able to train uh, numerical models, network-based models, the solutions without labeled data in the interior of the domain so specifically our problem we have a partial differential equation that describes the flow of two immiscible fluids think oil and water here in a one-dimensional domain u is the saturation of one of the phases say the volume fraction of the water if you will so u is the saturation subscript t means this is a partial derivative of u with respect to time so this is the accumulation term of the saturation f w is this nonlinear flux function so this is the relationship between the saturation, the resident saturation, and the flowing saturation. We refer to it as a flux function. So this flux function is usually a nonlinear S-shaped time flux function that describes F as a function of saturation. And the subscript of X here is the derivative of this flux function. So you have the derivative of the flux function in space and that describes the flux distribution spatially in this domain so we want to approximate this partial differential equation with a neural net how does that take place so we have a, a vector input of information that is a set of our saturations as a function of space and time and the first approximation to the solution y1 would be to take a weighted average of x this is w1 you apply an activation function on top of that the activation function has to necessarily be nonlinear, and that provides the first estimate of the solution you're looking at 
the next estimate from the next layer in the network would be to apply a bunch of weights to the previous layer approximation, possibly with a bias and an activation function. So you keep building this approximation from neuron to neuron, layer to layer, and then that will give you the approximation at the final layer of this uh, uh, network. And that is then the learned solution to the problem, why? And it can be written as this u hat, so it's an approximation of our saturation u, as a function of all of the theta parameters in the network. The theta parameters are basically the sets of all of the weights and the activation functions and the sets of the biases. So how do you actually train such a network? So we train the network by minimizing a loss function. Think of an objective function in optimization. So you define an objective function and you measure your distance to the solution by minimizing that loss function to very small values. So here, our loss function L is made up of two components. There is a loss function with respect to the dependent variable U, our saturations. And there is a loss function component that is a measure of the residual. So the residual, if you see at the bottom of the slide here, the residual is basically you put our equation on the right hand side so r is equal to this pde and when the residual as a function of this approximation u is zero that means that the equation is satisfied so when r is not zero the equation is far from the solution by a certain distance and when r is zero the approximation fulfills the equation. So we have now two components to the loss function. The first, again, is with respect to the saturations. Here, we are completely focusing on what we call the forward problem, meaning that the available information, the available labeled information to the problem only reside on the boundary of the domain. So we have we have initial data and we have boundary data that make up a Riemann problem. I'll say a lot more in the next few minutes, but that's all we have. We have input data for the initial state of the saturation. We have a boundary condition at the left side of this 1D domain, and that is the only available data. And LU then measures the distance of the U approximation from the available data, uh, the squared absolute difference, right? So that's the L sub U part, and the L sub R part is basically taking the residual, which is your approximation at an interior point in this 1D domain, uh, that squared approximation, and you sum it up, and that gives you the loss function of the residual. And so, the loss function again measures distance from the solution and as you minimize that hopefully you would be approaching the solution that satisfies the governing equation so here is now our forward nonlinear two-phase transport problem this is a very common problem in reservoir engineering in most cases you will find it within the few pages of the first chapter on the topic of multi-phase flow and transport in porous media. So it is referred to as the Buckley-Leverett problem. What makes the problem particularly difficult is the presence of a non-convex function. So to review, this is my conservation equation. You remember U is the conserved quantity, in this case, the saturation. Here we're talking about immiscible incompressible two-phase flow. So think of U as the saturation of the water. We have an initial condition that the saturation is zero in the interior everywhere. And we have a left condition or an injection condition on the left side of the boundary, if you will, where we fix the inlet saturation at unity. So you're basically injecting water 
unit saturation into an oil domain with a zero water saturation. So the flux function, this is a standard looking flux function. So you have your this S-shaped function and the fact that it is an S-shaped function with an inflection point is the cause of a lot of headaches in terms of finding the solution. However, we know for this very simple 1D problem as it is set up, we know that the solution, the analytic solution is indeed a traveling wave with a fixed height that moves at a constant speed and then you have a rarefaction uh, back to the inlet. So this is what we refer to as a mixed wave solution. Mixed wave as in there is a leading sharp wave and there is a rarefaction. So this is a mixed structure to the solution that is a strong function of having this uh, non-linear, non-convex flux function. So this is a simple 1D problem for which we know the analytic solution. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, physics-informed machine learning, so we try to solve this problem uh, using networks. So the network architecture is a fully connected one with eight layers, 20 neurons per layer. The training data available are 300 points, again, at the boundaries only, so that serves as the input. The training data for the residual are samples of thousands of points in the interior of the domain. These are not given data. This is just where you can pick a point in, in space and time and compute a residual and see how well you are doing. But the available data is only the initial condition and the boundary condition. Again, we're restraining ourselves completely to a forward description of the problem. The optimization algorithm is a second order quasi-Newton method, the LBFGSB. So this is a particular variant of a quasi-Newton method, but as I will say a bit later, the details of the optimization algorithm we have not found to be particularly important on the behavior of the overall network-based solution. So again, we have a 1D problem with our flux function. This is described as a Riemann problem, again, because we are starting with a uniform initial condition for the saturations, call it zero, and a uniform injection condition, uh, call it one. And we just saw that the solution is a mixed wave of a shock and a rarefaction. And here are now the solutions in space and time uh, based on the network-based solution. And on the right is the exact solution. Uh, so the network solution actually produces very large errors and the loss function is not very small at the end of this iterative process with the quasi-Newton method. So this is how you see this, uh, the results in uh, space time. If you plot them uh, using the normal methodology where you fix the time, so here this is the time, dimensionless time in pore volumes, so the time is at 0.25 pore volumes injected, at 0.5 pore volumes injected, and so on, and we're plotting the saturation as a function of distance at a given time, and you can see that in blue is the analytic solution we know with the shock and the rarefaction. In the dotted red, in uh, the dash red, this is the prediction from the neural net. And you can see how far it is from the solution. So the solution that you get from the neural net, as described, misses the front uh, gets some of the rarefaction, but misses the front location completely and gets lost uh, as time evolves in these problems. So this is what we get with this uh, neural net solution. So you might argue, okay, Hamdi, the, this must have been a vanilla version neural net. You need to be a little more sophisticated with what you did. So what we did, and actually what I mean is what... Uh, uh, Olga Fuchs did uh, is uh, 
looked at the different ways of initializing the network, uh, changing the number of hidden layers and uh, neurons per layer, change the number of collocation points in the interior, uh, add uh, more training data to the uh, input data for the boundary conditions and the initial conditions, play with various optimization methods, play with the parameters of the quasi-Newton methods, move on to CNN and try things like networks with skipped connections, play around with activation functions and regularizing weights and so on. So that's a lot of work that is documented in her dissertation. And if I may oversimplify things and say all of those variations seem to have made very little impact or difference to these results. So these enriched networks that are tasked to solve this hyperbolic looking equation, this conservation law, this nonlinear conservation law, these networks had all kinds of trouble dealing with that. So we tried a different approach. So if you start now looking at a slightly modified version of the conservation law. So you, you notice here, this is now a new term compared to what we've seen before. This is UXX is the second derivative of saturation and epsilon is a pre-multiplier. So you can think of this as a diffusion coefficient, a linear diffusion coefficient uh, next to this second derivative of the saturation. We haven't changed the other things. We still have a uniform initial condition and an injection condition of unity at the left. Same flux function, but now because we added this term, this partial differential equation, this conservation law now has what is called a parabolic form. Uh, what really matters here is adding this bit of diffusion gets you a smooth solution. And it has been proved by Lax that as you take away this diffusion that we added, as you bring it down to zero, then that leads to the solution of the hyperbolic problem in the limit of vanishing diffusion. So if you take the diffusion to zero, you're back to the hyperbolic problem. And if you wanna prove how the solution, the correct solution to the problem evolves and the shocks are located, you take away the diffusion to infinitesimally small values, and now you have a solution to your target problem. So we thought about that, and what we did is too simply, compared to what you saw before, you add to the loss function, instead of the residual being the hyperbolic form of the equation without diffusion, now the residual part of the loss function includes this diffusion coefficient epsilon. So, so for an epsilon, for a small epsilon of 2.5 times 10 to the minus three, and if you don't like diffusion and you prefer to work with Peclet numbers, because we've non-dimensionalized the length here to one, you can think of the Peclet number as one over epsilon. So this would be for a Peclet number of 400 you can see that now when you plot the saturation as a function of distance for different times, these are dimensionless pore volumes injected, you can see that the predicted solution from the network now working with a parabolic equation with a non-zero diffusion is very close to the exact solution. There is some smoothing around the edges of these of the front, but otherwise, I would characterize this from an engineering point of view as a high quality solution. The right front at the right location with the right speed and the right rarefaction evolution. So this is what the network gives if you give it a certain amount of diffusion. So I wanted to now describe the evolution of this loss function 
not just by looking at the final solution arrived through the optimization process, but to see how things evolve from a starting point. So when you start from a normalized say, loss function around unity, and now we're talking about steps, they are these sweeps through the network, you see that for large diffusion, the network converges very quickly compared to the other way. So this is the largest diffusion. Now the network is converging to an answer. Of course, the answer will have that larger amount of diffusion associated with it. But as you go to smaller diffusion, the behavior is much better and the system converges uh, quite nicely. If the diffusion begins to approach the zero diffusion limit, you see that the loss function actually stagnates and does sometimes even worse, uh, blow up and increase instead of decrease. Another way of visualizing the evolution of the loss is to now actually look at the gradient of the loss function with respect to the computed weights. And you can see some jitter here because of the network computation across the layers, but the same trend. Large diffusion leads to reduction of the gradient term on average, and so you are converging through this complicated system, while small diffusion ultimately blows up these gradient norms and you do not get a solution. So a finite amount of diffusion appears necessary for us to reach a solution that is reasonably close to the analytic solution, our target analytic solution. Uh, there are additional ways of visualizing uh, loss functions and loss surfaces without getting into the details. It is obvious that one would prefer to be looking at a loss function, even if it is projected in a lower dimensional space, that looks like this with a nice shaped cone and a smooth surrounding as opposed to landing in such a loss function that is full of kinks and local minima with sharp edges. So and there are ways to actually look at the loss functions that you have in the network by projecting them into lower dimensional spaces that human beings can actually see and analyze. So if you visualize these loss functions, this is basically confirming what we talked about before. If you have a large diffusion coefficient, relatively large diffusion coefficient in this projected two-dimensional space where our solution sits at the center of the square. You can see that the contours are well behaved and there is a large convex region that leads to the solution in the center of the domain. As a diffusion uh, gets smaller in this projected space, you see that the convex region gets very, very, very small and it has some kinks and difficulties and that explains why an optimizer would struggle to find the solution. If you really take diffusion to zero, again, zero diffusion takes us back to the original form of the problem in its pure hyperbolic form. And we know from uh, that that the solution was really garbage. And if you look at the solution in this uh, projected space, it doesn't have any structure. It's pretty random and the optimizer, regardless of how sophisticated, cannot find the time to solve this problem properly. Okay, so, so to recap where we are, and, uh, and I'll have, so I already spent 29 minutes on this. I'm gonna take four more minutes, if you don't mind, Heidi and Sebastian, and, and add a few more. No problem. Problem. Of course Thank not, you. Uh, you would have five more Thank minutes. No problem. So, so as you see it for now, so the recap is that this physics-informed machine learning approach targeting the pure forward problem in its hyperbolic form, we get very poor approximations. Working with the parabolic form by adding a, a small amount of diffusion seems to be the only thing needed for the neural net to learn a reasonably accurate approximation. And of course, the amount of diffusion influences the rate of convergence, but it also influences the quality of the approximate solution that you get. So in the last couple of minutes I have, we now explicitly try to give the 
neural net, a loss function that is a discrete version of the residual. Remember, we were giving it the actual differential form of the conservation law as we understand it, but now we actually discretize this equation. We discretize it explicitly. In this context, explicitly means that these terms of the flux are approximated at the previous time level, and the only unknown is the solution at the current time level. So this is the discrete form of the residual in explicit form, and we use that as the loss function, and we look at the results of what happens when you use that into the loss function. So if you give it this criteria, the CFL number, which is usually associated with the stability of the method, if you give it a CFL number that's larger than one, you get very bad answers from the network. Actually, this is quite similar to the behavior you would get from a finite difference or a finite volume approximation scheme. However, if you give it a small CFL number, then you see that the network that uses an explicit scheme in discrete form produces very good looking results. So as long as you honor the stability criterion of the scheme, uh, you get an excellent network solution. So, and we can explain why this happens because you can actually show that the explicit scheme, the discrete explicit scheme corresponds to solving an equation with a numerical diffusion D naught. Remember, this reminds you of the epsilon that we used. This confirms that by working with a PDE with a diffusion coefficient or its explicit form, will produce a very reliable answer. So we went one step further, and now we employed an implicit scheme. Implicit scheme means that this flux function is evaluated at the current time level, t plus delta t. So this now involves solving a system of equations because you have multiple unknowns in the accumulation term and in the flux term. But we also know that this form corresponds to a parabolic equation now with a slightly different looking numerical diffusion coefficient, which is always guaranteed to be positive. And if you give the network this loss function, you get these high quality approximations, of course, with a smoothing that would correspond to the numerical diffusion. You can reduce this smoothing by refining in space and in time, retaining the same CFL, which is greater than one and stable. And now with an even smaller diffusion, you get very accurate solutions from the network when you employ this implicit scheme. Okay, so this is my last slide for the presentation. Summary, again, physics and from machine learning, that we tried to solve forward nonlinear hyperbolic problems leads to poor approximations. Adding diffusion, working with the partial differential equation in its parabolic form, or working with the equation in a discrete form, which we know corresponds to a parabolic equation, leads to good answers from the network. Uh, the Stability properties that we see from using the discrete approach are similar to the discrete properties that you get from low order finite volumes. So these are the publications that Olga had produced during her PhD dissertation. And there is a long, long list of future work because here we really have only scratched the surface of trying to inject domain expertise from flow and transport in porous media with network-based approximations to get these solutions. So there is so much more to do. The list is quite long. If you're interested, let's talk. Uh, the work is supported by the Industrial Consortium on Reservoir Simulation, Supri B, where many, many member companies uh, have contributed to us. We thank Total for a generous gift on uncertainty quantification. And I thank the Stanford group 
the uncertainty quantification, the UQ group led by Daniel Tartakovsky. And I thank Cedric Frasis, a PhD student of mine, for our insightful discussions about machine learning that ultimately will lead to his PhD. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Hamdi, for this very interesting and engaging talk. We see already plenty of questions, also by friends and, and the audience. I would like to just give the floor to Sebastian. Thank you very much, Hadi, for, uh, Hamdi, for great talk. So, yeah, plenty, plenty, plenty of questions coming in. I'm trying to group them a little bit, and I start um, with one from Soren. Excellent topic and talk. The residual in the loss function on slide eight, one needs to, the solution to be smooth. How would this work in cases of shocks? Does one use residuals restricted to subdomains? I'm not sure I get all of that. How do I stop sharing my screen yes. so I can see? You should, you should find a way to, I have just taken it out of the show. Could you stop sharing? Do you have any? Maybe I have to bring back that, uh, that thing that allows me to stop sharing. Uh, let's see how do I do that, Sebastian? Could we uh, could we stop that from uh, because I see still his screen in the backup. Maybe we can force it to sh to stop the screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, it can only oh. kick. If I close my PowerPoint, will I find? Yes, I guess so. That would be maybe. Yes, can okay. you find it? So I close my PowerPoint and I should be looking for just the web browser. Just the web browser. So, okay. Do can you see? see oh yes, of course. You okay. see you, do you see yourself? Yes, I can okay, see great. the Thanks. two of you and I can I can see myself. Okay, so let's bring up um Soren's question again. So he yeah. wonders for the residual in the loss function slide I eight. The, you need a smooth solution. How would this it, work uh, in the case it, of shocks? It doesn't. I mean, so 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 what we ha what we have found is exactly that. So if if the loss function, uh, if you insist on giving the loss function the hyperbolic form of the PDE it is unable to find the solution and it does appear that diffusion basically provides that regularization and smoothing that enables it to find the right solution we still though do not understand why that happens right soren i mean uh, uh, with with the finite volume method we know that the finite volume method adds a corresponding diffusion coefficient through the discrete approximation. And indeed, when you give the network the discrete form of the residual, it actually finds the right solution. Now, that is a mystery. So if you can help us with resolving that, that would be great. But that's what we observe. Again, to summarize, you give the diffusion coefficient as part of the loss function in the PDE, the network is happy. You give the discrete residual to the PDE, which we know corresponds to an actual PDE with a diffusion, the network is happy. You insist on giving the network the conservation law in its hyperbolic form, the network is not happy. And the network is not happy to be specific. The network is not happy if solutions from the Riemann problem that start from smooth initial data evolve into shocks. Shocks throw the network off, and especially shocks with mixed waves really throw the network off. Does that uh, does that satisfy you, Soren? Ab absolutely, I could say. Soren also says that you already answered about Thank the future. So, so thanks. The, um... Kiaris says, thank you for the great talk. Have you tried to run it with linear relative permeabilities, convex fractional flows? If it works, perhaps the presence of an inflection point yeah. is non-convex so, 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 so linear relative permeabilities uh, and non-zero, like high viscosity ratios are a good friend uh, as long as the solution is a spreading wave. So you can usually set up the problem where you have a purely convex or concave uh, flux function and the solution is a a, a pure rarefaction, no shock. 
then the network has no problem. The solution is smooth and is, but if you do it still uh, with a uniform convex function where you get a pure shock, where the convex hull basically produces a pure shock. Think of a very high viscosity fluid displacing a very low viscosity fluid. You get a huge shock. The network gets very confused. Not as confused as it gets with a mixed wave Buckley leverett. But the presence of a shock basically messes up the network's ability to find the solution. Thank you. Staying on the topic of shocks, Raphael March um, wonders to use automatic automatic differentiation to compute the derivatives. If you have experienced oscillations around the shock, even with EPS, it's a pretty sharp gradient. No, so so we uh, uh, automatic differentiation with analytic tools is used for both forward and backward propagation. So the gradients through the network are, are computed with uh, automatic differentiation, both to sweep forward and backward no no, no use of uh, uh, differences thank you so we have one of our former speakers um, asking a question martin blunt um, from the fascinating work you could study semi-analytical solutions for spontaneous inhibition there's no shock um, machine learning is valuable to quantify fracture matrix transfer and dual porosity in a dual porosity simulator yeah hi hi, hi martin uh yes we haven't done that. Uh, we have not done that yet. But yeah, I, I think this is an area where uh, uh, machine learning and network-based computing, especially if you have lots of uh, measurements to integrate with the forward problem, it would be uh, a very useful uh, tool. And and I, so when I have one or two minutes, I, I'd like to say a few things so you guys, not everybody thinks that uh, I think machine learning is good or bad. I, I have a few things to say. If you give me the last minute, uh, just give me a heads up. But CS yeah. Martin, I, I, I see lots of potential for integrating machine learning for spontaneous systems as you described and understanding the complex behavior of uh, fracture matrix uh, interactions. So one more question on relates to the Current discussion from Kiarash. Um, how about using some other loss function formulation instead of the mean squared error? Uh, good, uh, yeah, I think uh, great question. We have not played with uh, different variants of the loss function, and I and I always say we. That was Olga, the PhD student. Professors don't do much except work with smart young people. So Olga tried many many things, but I don't think we fiddled too much with the loss function. We fiddled a little bit with giving weights to the two components of the loss function. And that just added another knob that we didn't understand. So we, we went back to a simple loss function. And I would say, yes, if you have ideas about a more appropriate loss function, uh, we, we, we'd love to try it. Thank you. Switching topics a little bit um, and sort of talking about the value or the, the advantages that the machine learning could bring. Um, Kjertil Holtz-Lier asks, um, very nice talk, how does the run time compare to traditional simulator solver with the same accuracy? Uh, so, uh, what can I say? So, so the problem you saw is a 1D problem for which we know the analytic solution, right? We didn't try to compare, say, a high performance finite volume solver to machine learning. But if I were to guess based on what I have seen, it's an absolute disaster. Machine learning is very inefficient because we're solving a 1D problem for which we know the solution to. That does not mean that uh, at one point it's not going to be competitive or efficient. We're not saying that. We're saying for now, machine learning applied blindly to solve a forward nonlinear problem is may not be the way to do it. Uh, so as of today, comparisons to, to, to computation time and cost are not relevant yet because machine learning is not competitive in any way yet with forward problem. But, and maybe this is the time to do it, 
so having said all of this, you want to remember that the context of machine learning, where things have been extremely successful and continue to bring great promise, is when you use machine learning to integrate data, when you have lots of data and you're doing inverse modeling, for example, if you have measurements of saturation in the interior of the domain, it doesn't take many saturation measurements in the interior of the domain to really get a highly approximate network solution. But that gets you in the world of inverse problems. So for inverse problems where you have measurements of say saturations and rates, or for uncertainty quantification problems where you have multiple realizations, but you have tons of measurements, you wanna integrate the solution, then a network-based, a smart network-based solution may very well be competitive. But in the confines of this one, talk forward 1d nonlinear problem uh, machine learning uh, has a ways to go so another question from soren um who wonders when solving the buckley leverett equation by standard numerical schemes a mismatch in the shock location indicates a loss of mass conservation can one ensure this is this in the pmi uh, approach a physics important machine learning approach for example, as a constraint, I'm 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 smiling, uh, Soren, because this is a this is a fun. Maybe we should work on this together. It yeah, we think we think it can. So this is the this is the strange thing about the uh, adding diffusion to the equation mm -hmm. or using the discrete form of the equation. Mm -hmm. We know in the finite volume world that uh, the discrete form actually leads to this small diffusion that allows you to find the unique solution that honors the entropy condition. We know that in a finite volume method. But I don't know what's going on with the network. I have no clue why the network finds the right entropy uh, solution, Soren. So on that re and related topics, I think we should work with you. Open question. Great, thank you. So there are quite a lot of questions coming at the moment that are perhaps slightly more on the on the philosophical side um, about the future of machine learning. And I know you were itching to comment on that, um, make some comments before we close that session. So I'm switching, holding those back for a moment um, and just pull up one question that is from Wilhelmin van Rooyen um, that is very similar to what a number of other people have asked and um, thanks you for the presentations. The studies presented here about one deep buckley level problem for which analytical solutions exist conveniently. How about applying machine learning for more complex, more field relevant cases? No other questions around 3D um, dealing with heterogeneity and so forth. You commented yeah. on this briefly in future work um, in your final slides. So how far away are we from that? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the for the question. That's exactly what I wanted the opportunity to comment on. So, so for the many people that I see here, uh, friends and colleagues, the way I think is, I I, I first want to solve the the simple problem uh, before I jump in. But in the end, we're actually very very interested in the group and in the department and the wider community that's here in solving three D complex heterogeneous field scale problems that have all of the physics that you want. That's our objective. And we love to solve problems that are relevant to the practical setting. However, what we're saying here with, with, with the machine learning framework is if you want machine learning to replace your standard forward reservoir simulator, my argument is you're gonna be waiting a very long time. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you have a problem that is rich with data and measurements and a great deal of uh, inversion requirements, so you're doing history matching and you're trying to optimize what to do next and the data continues to come in, then a network-based framework to condition the data and train the models and query the large high dimensional uncertainty space may ultimately be the most efficient way to do optimization and uncertainty propagation. So I, I think the promise and from other people in my department and many of the people that are present here, they work on uncertainty propagation and optimization. 
with data-rich machine learning and with integrating data machine learning and physics-informed machine learning. So, yeah, I mean, we're not giving up on that. I'm just showing you a, a specific subset that has been a challenge. And I mentioned Cedric Frasis, a PhD student that many of you know. And Cedric's target is to solve a multi-dimensional heterogeneous forward problem uh, with machine learning. And uh, we'll see how it goes. If Cedric can't do it, I would be skeptical. But we're, we're, you know, that's what a PhD is for. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, um, Hamdi and I, we are determined to continue running that uh, webinar series. We hope the pandemic is not going to last as long as the PhD students finish, but once <laughs> we crack that problem, we make sure we invite Maybe you. Maybe Cedric will present okay. in person when the time comes. <laughs> Good. Um, so we talked about a little bit on sort of the advantages, disadvantages of, of machine learning. Um, and I think you have pre answered quite a bit on this, but just in case you want to have some further comments. This is a two-part question from Hamid Diab Montero. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Machine learning gets quite some criticism sometimes when used for producing prediction-based predictions of physics-based problems. Could you comment on the future of physics-based machine learning in relation to topics like causality and generalization? Is there anything else to raise? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's an excellent topic, and I, and I would frame it more as a research target. We are very much interested in that, and my objective here is to basically get enough people either critical or excited about the topic so that we can have a deeper discussion. Uh, what is interesting in the context of, of what we looked at, a lot of our friends tell me that we've given the machine learning the most difficult problem I, I, a good friend tells me, Hamdi, you keep saying it's a simple Buckley level problem, but that's a nasty problem with a lot of complexity. And that may very well be the case. Uh, insisting on moving shocks and rarefactions may not be the best thing for machine learning. And I would agree that it is not. What is really interesting, and we've seen a lot of works from many people, I'll mention here, uh, Karnia Dakis and uh, his co-workers and Zavaras and his co-workers, and I know there are many others, where they're trying to use machine learning to infer physics we don't quite understand. Meaning, use machine learning, say, to close a complicated constitutive relationship that you really don't know what it is, and it lives in a high dimensional space, and machine learning may be the best way to derive it. So they, they provide some cool, interesting examples with things like turbulence flow and bifurcation and so on. And yeah, I think when, when, when you're trying to understand the physics, fine. What I find difficult here is that for the things we think we know the physics for, it seems machine learning and physics informed machine learning is so critical. And I keep saying we had to inject a great deal of Olga's intelligence and knowledge to make machine learning work. So I'm, I'm beginning less and less uh, enamored of the name machine learning. It's it's network computing with a lot of intelligence. No? I take one more question. I need to apologize that there's so many questions that I couldn't, um, couldn't put forward, way too many questions. Um, I think we could easily discuss for another hour, but just because you mentioned um, machine learning, and Rami is one of your former PhD students. Yes. Um, he wonders spectral collocation methods um, have been overstudied over the past decades, including problems with weak solutions. How does this knowledge translate to PIML? Uh, good to hear from you, Rami. I, I don't know if Rami wants to remember the long time ago when he was my PhD student. <laughs> uh, so Rami, uh, yeah, I mean, what it, it is, I think using polynomials could be very interesting. This may be a chance to uh, uh, revive some of those works and maybe integrate them more with inverse uh, modeling. I think there is so much to uh, to learn from reviving many, many of the pre-existing uh, methods. Uh, and Rami, you know this uh, better than most. A lot of the current... Uh, excitement about network-based solutions have become uh, usable because of enormous computing power, especially from GPUs and the like. 
algorithmically in terms of numerical methods, I think it is time to dust off some of the things many of us have worked on and with the compute power available, work with them to enrich networks and to enrich machine learning with, uh, with new uh, analysis. Great. Um, uh, thank you very much, Emily, for the excellent talk, um, for the great answers. Thank yeah. you to our audience for the uh, many questions. Again, apologies that time wasn't enough to, to pass every one of your questions onwards to Amni and some last comments from Hardy before we pause for today. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, again, sorry for not being able to uh, address all the questions. I would like to just quickly take the chance to announce the next speaker is uh, Professor Maren Breme from TU Delft. Uh, Maren is going to speak about geothermal uh, reservoirs and heat production from geothermal systems. Uh, until uh, next week, please stay happy, healthy, and tuned. And we see you all again next week, the same time, 4 p.m. Central European, 7 a.m. California, 3 p.m. British time. All the best. Thanks a lot, Hamdi. It was really a nice uh, webinar. Thank and good you. to see you all. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.